And the joy of this is that Melvin Sikorsky has not been here. And he's been somebody that we've been showing for the last couple of years. He's come from LA. It's uh, sort of twisted his arm and got him to come. Tomorrow he turns around and flies back first thing in the morning for a uh, pre-party for the Academy Awards. So it's a tight trip for him, but we are very happy that he came. I'm pleased to see all of you here. Harry and Gigi Benson and Joyce Tennyson, two fabulous artists that are part of our roster here. We are very pleased to have you here today as well. I also want to thank, you know, I'm being told basically to sit in the chair and be nice. I don't really do a lot of the work for these shows. It's a mountain of work. And our team is amazing. So Gabe designed the show. Rosanna pulled it together. Jody's made all of the arrangements with Jay for what's going on here. CC has done all of the audio visual and um, Mario's helped too and Mario has written the press releases and uh, conducted an interview with Melvin. So we are extraordinarily happy uh, to have this show and I'm thankful for everybody being here and I'm thankful for my team because I really can't do this. They do this. So it's wonderful. Uh, can you, I think a good place to start is, you know, when we were speaking, you said, you know, when you grew up, you did not grow up a privileged life. So can you talk about how you sort of evolved in, into a profession of photography? I will make an attempt. I came from a very poor family in New York City lived on the Lower East Side, and I was literally a depression baby from the, at, at that time. And uh, is somebody talking? No, it's just his phone. He's turning it off. Uh, you got to talk into your mic. I will talk into my mic. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and I started to look at photographs starting with my father was working at a place that made that was a lithography place and he would bring back magazines and books that they printed and I would look at them and say well, where did this come from and he'd say I don't know and then I saw things that they had done for offices on so I went up to a newsstand and found the magazine I wanted to be in Harper's Bazaar. Everybody laughed at me. They said, you don't understand. You, what do you know? You're just a kid. So uh, I started taking pictures at first at the newsstand where there was a homeless person. And when I brought the picture and developed it and made a print, I felt very bad because I realized I had no right to take a picture of this man who didn't know me and the picture made everybody that looked at it feel very bad. And at that time, subconsciously, somehow, I decided that I wanted to take pictures and make people feel good. I was not interested. Uh, there was enough you could see around you why not make somebody feel good? So I started to take some pictures for myself that I thought were feel good pictures. And I brought them up to an advertising agency called Doldane and Burnback. And somebody there that was an author, Ira Mesa, said, you know, there's something about your pictures, kid, that I like. So keep coming back and I'll get something for you to do. So what I did was I came back in about a month and he reaches under his desk and throws me a coat with a fur collar. He said, if you do something decent with this, that's the word he used, I'll give you a name credit. So I took a picture of, a, I actually took a picture of my wife in it and some friend of mine said, you don't understand. Get somebody that's a famous model. Every, you, you're doing everything through your own, what they
things that you love, and that might be right for something, but so I called the Eileen Ford model agency, and they said, we never heard of you. They said, where are you located? I said, at that time I had rented a studio at 322 East 39th Street. So oh, you were around the corner. So who do you like? I said, Anne St. Marie. They said, oh, we'll send her around this afternoon, because literally four blocks away. Anne St. Marie comes in. I open the door. And it's amazing models. They were all painted up. And I had six sheets of film that I got that were left over from um, Bill Helburn, was a photographer at the time, and I knew his assistant, who gave me six outdated sheets. So when I opened the door, the next door neighbor's door came in, and she picked it up. It was a Pekingese, and I took a picture of her with, with my own lights, because at that time, uh, it was a kind of standard lighting system. And what I discovered in my experiments that everybody somehow wanted a fresh white studio. I painted the studio back dark, and they, I was considered the master of gloom. <laughs> Why did I do this? Because I had white flats, and I bounced some lights off the white flats. And what I discovered was that if you didn't have a, white bounces everything like a ping pong ball, all over the place. But if you have a black studio, you can actually put a flat as a fill, and if you put two of them on the right as a, as a main light, or you can move them forward. So I was, I was learning how to see through the camera on the ground glass light. I took the picture that, but to replace the next to the incandescence I could see, I put a strobe on. And I shot six for a rolls of six sheets of eight by ten. Uh, took them up to Ira. He said, this is pretty good. And so he ran it in Harper's Bazaar as an ad. And up the side, it said Mel Sikorsky. Hmm. And I was so thrilled when it came out. And then about two weeks later, there's a voice on the phone calling and says, Hello, my name is Henry Wolf. I'm the art director of the bazaar. And I saw <laughs> you a picture for Fram Fuzz, and I thought it was neat. <laughs> and I said to myself, that's my brother Stanley screwing around with me. <laughs> <laughs> so I hung up. <laughs> The next thing I know is the phone rings again, and he says, well, I think we were disconnected. <laughs> and he offered me two pages that guaranteed and a cover try. I did the two pages with somebody named Chino Machado wow. for all uh, the yeah. with cash bears. I didn't get the cover. And uh, so I visited Henry, and he looked at the pictures, he said, oh, you're stronger than I thought you'd be. How would you like to be a permanent fixture here? And I was, became a Harper's Bazaar photographer. Hmm. Then I had other problems that I didn't understand, both upcoming problems. Deanna Vreeland was a renegade of Nancy White was, was part of, let's say, the uh, ownership of the magazine. So she was very conservative. But the Anna Vreeland wanted things that were different. So if, the, if I go into Deanna's office, she would say to me, Mr. Sikorsky, is there something that you can do that can, will, will thrill the eye that doesn't look like what we've done before. So she kind of gave me permission to try. So I did some pictures on a, on a peeling, a tenement that had peeling walls. And had, it was a hobble, kind of. 
and it had the new American collections of flowered dress that looked fantastic. And I took the picture and went up to the bazaar and Nancy White called me and she said, Mr. Sikorsky, the bazaar, had the, the subscribers to the bazaar wouldn't know the place that you're photographed in. Couldn't you do something more elegant? And Deanna said, well, that's the point. It's an impressionistic painting. And she said, oh, I've had it and let it run. Then letters came saying, who's this new photographer? What's, you know? And once you have subscribers accepting, it is fine. Uh, I did a pic bunch of pictures on the subway. I sort of designed, I don't know how many of you know Reginald Marsh, the painter. And he did a lot of stuff. Really they would, they absolutely wouldn't run them. They said it was putting it louder. People that read the bazaar do not go on the subway. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was an education for me. And I had great support from Henry Wolf. But they didn't like him because he, what, here's what an art director does. When somebody's new, they're trying to find a new identity for themselves. They don't want to look like, uh, uh, let's say, uh, who was it? Uh, I forget the name of, of, of the guy they had before, Bradovich. Brodovich looked at my pictures. I brought them up before I met Henry Wolf. Uh, he made noises like that and walked me to the elevator. <laughs> no, this is absolutely true. I was on the elevator I with tears in my eyes. So then Nancy said to me, because it, after all of this little success, she said, are you up for the Paris collection of 1963? I said, yes. She said, do you have an idea? I said, yes. But at that time, it was in the air that that was going to happen. Allie McGraw, do you know who Allie McGraw is? The love story. Well, she was Mrs. Breedland's assistant. And Mrs. Breedland, when I used to go in to see her and go through clothes, with her. Ali, this beautiful girl that should have been on that Girl, get me that club. She called her girl. <laughs> and she had Nana von Schlerberger, which was a model at that time, who couldn't see well. And she had to take off her glasses. She would literally couldn't see. And then had to take off her clothes, which was embarrassing. He has a 20-year-old kid sitting there, and she's all naked to try on clothes. So, uh, what happened then was, Deanna said to me, I'll try to keep your bubble idea a secret because we have to be very careful to get it to the day that it's too late to change the idea. So I said, okay. So this was a, for you, it was a sort of a breakaway idea. And, and yes, uh, I had the, okay, I, I, when I was a kid, I used to go to Rizzoli's with my father, and I saw a painting called The Garden of Earthly Delights by Hieronymus Bosch. And in it, there's a plant that's a bubble with people in it. And I've always dreamed that I would like to do that. I didn't know how to do it. But when the idea for the bubble, for the collection came up, you, you'll notice the, co the orange cover. I don't know, can you go to that orange cover? I don't cover? think I have the, it's there. you had it in the movie. Yes, that's it. Right. But I, I, okay, I have to sorry. go back and play the movie. You can't, then, then don't bother. So at, at any rate, what happened was, uh, I built the bubble, we tested it in the studio. In fact, one of the tests is right on the wall there. That's outside of my studio. Which is the middle picture of uh, New York, the New York bubble. It's, it's, it's the one right now. Can you see me pointing? Yeah, it's the middle one on this wall here. 
and obviously it was possible to do. And then we went to um, Weehawk in New Jersey, and we got the actual bizarre dress. We shot it, I brought it in, Nancy White said, wow, it's beautiful, you can do beautiful things. In other words, it didn't have something weird in it. She thought that I was weird. <laughs> so it didn't have something, and they used it as a cover. Uh, then Dick Avedon got the wind of it and said, you better be careful. You know, this is in New York and you have everything you want. In Paris, we don't have all those things. So make sure that he promises to shoot in the studio if something goes wrong. Uh, this is Paris. The lady with the funny hat is Allie McGraw. You see that? Yeah. Recognize her now? Yeah. And that, this is on the bridge at Alexander Clark, and that's where we were lifting the bubble to, to do that picture. I don't know if it's, it's part of my collection, but I don't know. <coughs> that any, any sort of mishaps, any sort of funny stories? Well, yes, there's a funny story. So with, my idea was to do a narrative. You start over New York, you land on the Seine, you go through Paris, but I, my idea was any place in, around Paris that you shoot, it's not going to look at all the doorways, signs, every, I didn't want to do the Eiffel Tower, I didn't want to do a travel line. So they, would, they understood that. So we had a hairdresser named Alexandre, and they had a special, uh, the, the petite camion for historically butchering for, for Alexander. So he did Simone's hair, and the truck that was being used was about 100 feet away. And Simone came walking down, walked over to the bubble, and by that time, it was, when you're shooting the collections for March, it's late February, and the hair was blown all over. So, the editor said to me, you know what, I think we ought to gather up and get to the studio because this stuff is going to be coming every, you have a dress for an hour. So I said, wait a second, I, we can do it. They said, well, how? I said, Alexan, come with me. So I put Alexan and with Simone in the bubble. He did her hair, he slipped out, she stood up, I shot 20 rolls of film, and I had the bubble on the set. Ah, okay, amazing. so now you discover something else. There's a dark room that's a block away from the St. Regis Hotel where everybody's living. And in that dark room you make the prints that are supposed to go into the pouch for the next day to get to New York. Now, we're, 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 I, I shot them. And Nancy White, who was living in the St. Regis, said, I have to sign off on everything. So you come to my room, I don't care what time it is. I said, okay. And she would sign off on it. <coughs> we'd go into the pouch and get to New York. So there we were, we shot through the most of the collection. And we were on the last picture. And I had an assistant named Frank Pinocchio who had come from the Avedon studio because he started to socialize with some of the clients and people that he was photographing, he got fired. Yes, and he said to Frank, me, right? <laughs> yes, that's Frank. They said to me, do you need an assistant? I said, yes, he came. And he taught me a lot because I didn't know how to archive anything. So what he would do was number the negatives if there was a choice negative, he'd put a notch on it, uh, put it into uh, manila uh, envelopes, wrote what it was about. I just shot everything and put it in like one, two, three, four. Yeah. So Frank was a, a great help. Can I ask you a question? When you look at the bubble pictures, especially the bubble pictures in France, and you see the, the people that are watching, um, most fashion work, if it was shot in the studio, Everybody that's there belongs there. Well, these are. Yeah, no, my, what about the people? Here's my idea. The idea. Let me. Uh, do I give you? 
let's say all of us walked down the street, and all of a sudden there was an explosion in the sky, there was two people flying down from towards us. Everybody would react in their own way. My idea was to put something in the, in the perspective that didn't, n nobody would expect. So there's nobody, everybody's dressed in their own clothes. Every, if I went to a school, those are all school people. So those are not extra. And there that is not that? one extra in these pictures. Gotcha. There are people just responding in awe to what yes. they're seeing. Yes. Uh, not that would be phony. Uh, here's what you had to do. You didn't have to direct. The, the only direction I may have done is like, let's say when the cop came up to Simone, I would go like, and he was like, really get out of here. What are you people doing here? But he was alone. And my idea was, so by the time he gets anybody here, we'll go. <laughs> so can you talk about why some of the pictures are color, some of the pictures are black and white? Yes. At the bazaar, as they call it, if you take three or four, and let's say you do the order, and you take four pages, you may get six pages of color. But if you take no ads or one ad, you'll get your pages that are black and white. So here was the mistake that I made about uh, archiving. When a picture was chosen and it was notched to be printed, it went in one box. When it was color and it was not to be printed, it went in another box and Frank wrote on the box, out. So that outs box had been sitting in, you know, on a shelf under my house with all of the, you know, the archive uh, as outs. And people started to say, do you have it in color? I said, I did shoot it in color, but I don't know where it is. I can't find it. I, I literally thought it was lost. <laughs> then one day, I was told by, I, it was actually my wife, she said, you know what? You can't find it. People are asking, why don't you open every box that you know? Just methodically open everything. I opened the out box and I started to cry. There was just a pack of it there. So we started to print it. And uh, what's, what really happened that was interesting was I've looked at these pictures for so long, I can't see them anymore. It's sort of like, no matter how good a picture is, or how everybody tells you how wonderful it is. It's sort of like you know, anything wears out. When we started printing these, it was like a new life for me in, in, in many ways because I had never seen them printed in color. But besides that, I realized that when you send stuff up to a magazine, the art director makes the choice, and then they say, do you like it or whatever, but you have the... They picked all the wrong pictures. <laughs> if you look at that issue and look at what they picked, it's scary. And what I, I discovered after a while, the closer the picture, the suit was, or whatever the girl was wearing, those are the tones of things they chose, because management wanted to show details in a dress that somebody was going to buy. It was uh, the difference between, let's say, Deanna and Nancy, two very, very nice people. One was somebody who said, you see these buttons? This, there's so-and-so. And Deanna wanted an impression. She said, if you love something, you're going to look at it. And if you try it on and you don't like it, you're not buying it. These are expensive clothes. And at any rate, that, that's what happened. And what was it like working with a crew? I mean, Simone Delacour, for example, your model. How was she? And all the people that, uh, with the boom and the crane and the okay. here's, here's, coordinate here's this. The thing. Uh, 
here's the thing I discovered. We did everything with people in my studio. We had Eli, and we had my brother helping me. Uh, uh, in other words, Frank Finocchio, uh, Ali. So it was like a crew of like 10 people maybe. Plus, including the people from Office Bazaar. So shipping this stuff to Paris was like about $3,000, $4,000 then. And putting this stuff in, then there was Michelle and, uh, and the other crane guy. And we got a small crane that lifted signs. And if I said to Michelle, when I move my hand down, the crane would go down lower. If I raise my hand, I would be, it was simple adjustments. Recreating an, an insurance, we had the normal insur no insurance. So the whole shoot maybe was, with everything, shipment, people, $12,000, $15,000. Right now, if you try to do that, you would be like, it would have to be a million dollars. It, it's prohibitive now. But everybody worked well together as a team. It was, like, you know what, other than the first day, because everybody was scared and I had blue and so on, and I had to put it out of his own. As pictures were coming in, and we were getting feedback, uh, magnificent, the best thing that's ever been for the bazaar, any magazine, and uh, then I got back something that when it finally got printed, Allie came to me and she said, no. Don't you dare say this to anybody. But Mr. Avedon said, what has he got for a second act? <laughs> <laughs> so I, so I, then I, I couldn't figure it out. And at that point, Henry had a lot left. And he became a friend and gave me a lot of work in his other show magazine and all of that. I said, I don't understand. He said to me, stop being a 12 year old. I said, what do you mean? He said, he sees you as competition. Exactly. I said, how could that Rick, Dick Avedon, I, Dick Avedon looked at was like 12, He's, he was God. And I didn't understand that until after that. So I have another question for you. The three photographers that we're showing here, Jim, La Jim Lee had a very active commercial life, doing um, you know fine art pictures and doing a lot of commercial campaigns. Um, Albert Watson, the same thing. He does his own editorial work, which is a sort of fine art work, if we call it that, and a lot of commercial work. What about you? What was it like to do a lot of commercial work and? Were you allowed to be as creative as you wanted to, and how did you mix the two? Actually, yes, because somebody told me a story, and you know, it was Irving Penn, who was like a god to me. You've got to understand my age, and these are like all the guys. Uh, did some uh, makeup ads. And when you looked at his editorial work, it was, you know, street on people's face, like wonderful editorial picture. But the ads were very straightforward. So when they asked Mr. Penn why he couldn't do it to look like editorial, he said, you gave me a job that was supposed to solve a advertising problem, and that's the best way to solve it. Uh, you didn't say to me that you wanted something offbeat or whatever. Uh, when I thought about it, was, and I, I, I was not brilliant or priestier or anything. If I took a picture and it didn't interest me, it never came out good. So I felt, why not take the full shot? Why not make any picture you take as good as you can make it? Forget who the advertiser it is or what. As long as it has certain criteria that fits the bill of what they need, why not? So that's the way I did everything. 
and I got a huge amount of work. Uh, I, I got accounts, I won't even name them, from everybody that was the, to considered the greats at that time. I got DuPont, I got, uh, I remember going, coming out of a meeting with somebody, Bernie Owen gave me a big campaign. And the person that was in there before me was um, Dick Avedon. He had talked to them about a location. And I remembered him saying something I could hear out the door. Who's a greater designer than God? You know, it was whatever the location was. And I was I, I, I couldn't even put sentences together that were involved with impressing somebody in that way. So I have another question for you. But I got the account. Why? <laughs> because what I did was fresh. It wasn't a smart ass answer. So here's something that sort of ties into that. If I was an artist and I wanted to pick a decade to work that was fresh with ideas, fresh with the world changing in huge ways and fresh with sort of potential, it would be the 60s. I mean, the 60s were a magical generation. I know that um, Joyce was active, then Harry Benson took some of his most creative work then. I mean, so many photographers, this was like an emerging decade. What were your influences in the 60s? Did you have any, and what was it like working then compared to working now? What I would say is, secretly, I was a smart ass kid. Okay? That would be very good. I looked at pictures and criticized them in an odd way. I said, well, this is boring. I'd rather look at the paintings at the Metropolitan. Uh, when I looked at paintings, there were ideas. All painters had palettes of their own. Photographers, it became a time when the umbrella of the light was invented. Everybody used an umbrella light at 10 feet away at F-16. Uh, I, I made lights, I made fluorescent lights, and people said, you can't use fluorescent, it makes people look green but I got day glow fluorescence that made this beautiful skin and I was able to control the light and they said, how did you do that? So inventiveness is always wanted. It's more than words, it's more than an individual. If you go someplace and you see something and it gives you a stick in your heart as I call it, you say, hey, I want that. It's not about words or talking somebody into something, it's an emotional thing. How do people fall in love? They, somebody would we walk down the street and somebody would say, wow, well, isn't she great? And I'd say, no. <coughs> so everybody has a, a vision, but in that vision, it is highly important that it reaches people. And when you reach people in the proper way, and it gives them joy, for instance, let me give you what I, what I said, and I, 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 because I've been knocking a lot. Harry Benson took a picture of the Beatles jumping on the When you look at that, if you can't see that's joy, or whatever, uh, you're, there's something wrong with you. So the, no matter what Harry says, the picture's gonna beat him Harry loves the picture, by the well, way. I, I'm, I'm just, Harry thoroughly owns that picture. He loves it. No, no, I'm not. I'm not trying to be cute here or anything. But I'm that's the truth. Shy. What? I'm very shy. <laughs> he's a man of few words. And that, he's very that, shy. That's just why, like that, that, you know, that's why I, I can't that. get a word out. <laughs> Melvin can't get a word no, out. No, it, it's it's <laughs> it's true. Okay. I, how do they come up with that example? I could have said I like Harry Benson if there was a maudlin picture, well, you would think I was, I was crazy. But when you look at that picture, deny it. Show me. I think great pictures outlive their time. They have a presence, you look at them, they have an incredible freshness, and a lot of 60s pictures are like that. Can I ask you about this picture? Because if I was writing a paper on complicated images, to me, it is one of the most complex images with the use of the mirror 
the use of the framing, the tilted construction. I don't know how she's not terrified being there. Can you talk about how you built okay, the picture? Let me, like let me say something. Dorothy and McGowan, they talk about supermodels and so on. Dorothy and McGowan is a supermodel beyond anybody's belief. Number one, a week before I asked her to do the collection in 1965 flying children, her father died. She never told me and decided to go anyhow. She's fearless. When we did the picture over, it's called Fly Dior, and she was hanging off an eighth inch cable Five stories down, if that cable broke, she would fall to the street on, on Avenue St. Montaigne, and, and you know, yet she's up there with you. I used to say to her, how do you do it? She said, because Melvin, I trust you, and the truth is that I've never told you, I can fly. <laughs> How many times did this have to happen till it happened right? This picture. This picture is, is this picture is interesting to me, and I'll, let me explain. Do you know uh, Velasquez's son, Las Vegas? Yep. Yes. Well, in Velasquez, he paints everybody in a mirror. In other words. He, you are looking at things through a mirror, including himself. So what I did is I found this, this is the, actually this place is the, is the dining room in the St. Regis Hotel, it's not a set. And what I did was I flew her behind me and she's reflected in the mirror. So you see the people <coughs> Are those, those actors? The, no, the, those are people. They're just not having dinner there, no, right? Those are people I know. She comes flying by. Serves <laughs> not <laughs> uh, Just people like the, uh, yeah. uh, 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 let's say I go to this crowd. You, 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 and you. You want to get dressed to come tonight. Sure. And we put it together. <laughs> and but how is she flying? How is, that's I know there's a corset, you'll tell us. Okay. Try to picture this. If you had a very strong, well, I, I welded three inch tubes of steel pipe into a tripod. I made a U shaped piece of welding and I put a bolt through it. I put a cable with a winch at the back, like a hand winch. And the cable dropped and hooked onto three, one of the three hooks. If you took the top hook, she would hang straight. If you took the middle hook, she would lean more towards you, and so on. So I was able to control that. And two guys sat at the other end. I could take that thing in here. That was yeah, anywhere. I, here's the problem. Not the problem, here's the solution. I was never an engineer. I never had the great education that I would have liked to have. I started at CCNY and had to leave because my father got sick, came down with multiple cirrhosis, and I had to, I had to um, support a whole family. But if I had an idea, I was unrelentless to do it. I dreamed about it, I could see it, and I somehow, as if I lived in another life, I knew how to do it. And it always, it always it, worked. It, yes, it always worked. <laughs> in fact, Eli, who was a safety freak by studio, said, Melvin, you're not an engineer. This is a human being you're putting in there. <laughs> and I say, Eli, let's test it. And when we <laughs> test it, I would put like a 250 pound person on it and we'd have to put a third person on the other end. I said, break it, jump. They couldn't. So then, then he started to trust me. But where it came from, I don't know. 
I just saw. Can I, I ask you psychologically too about if I was a sort of a psychologist, a lot of the pictures that you're really famous for are pictures about flying, are pictures about defying gravity. Where do those come from? Okay. I, first, this is, when I was a kid, if I had a fever, I sort of felt that I could levitate off the, off the bed. And I would ask my mother, did I fly into your room? And she looked at me like I was nuts. But I, whenever I had a fever, I felt that I, in fact, today, Sometimes I have a feeling that I can levitate, but I just can't figure out why it's not working. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, look, we're, we're complex creatures, and things happen that we don't understand. Uh, for me, uh, my son is pretty much like this too. We're looking at the stair rail there. And I said, like, it's beautifully made. And my son, who's a details person, said, yeah, but the bolts are mismatched. Okay, th that, that's the oddity of, of who we are. Uh, In a sense, though, I, 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 have, I have a term that I always use. It's come across because I would show the patty. Copyright patent guy, two pictures. He says, but they're the same picture. I said, no, they're not. I said, you don't, you don't notice that her head is tilted up? Oh, I didn't notice that. Well, you should notice that. That's your job, to notice what's different. If you're sitting there, and you move your hand to the, over you to your knee, and I took a picture of you where your hand, isn't it a different picture? I call it aesthetic blindness. And you know who's aesthetically blind? Most every museum. No, 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 no. Most every, most every uh, gallery. They, they don't actually see real details. For instance, in Harper's Bazaar, bubble on the same, if you get the magazine, it's not the picture we use. My head is tilted up. The one that I use is where heads looking forward. It's a, it's okay. If you look at the strip of, of of two and a quarters, it's the next shot. She did this. She did this. One's better. When when you're looking at a bunch of contacts, don't you make a circle on the one you like best? Because somebody at the magazine thought that was better because she liked it better or he liked it better. That's nonsense. If you did an edit, if you could get Picasso here, and you said, pick out your five best pictures, and he pulled out five pictures, and, 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 and you look at them, and they weren't the ones that we are seeing in every magazine and so on, would you say you're wrong? I, I mean, the originator of any idea had reasons that are beyond any of the ones you could pick. But you certainly have a right to like what you, oh, I was with a friend of mine named James Rosenquist, and we were looking at a Picasso <laughs> exhibit. And they had a person walking along with us, and that person walking along with us was somebody telling us about Guernica, the Picasso painting. And a lady was standing next to you know, next to us, and as she was walking around, she said to her friend, "My Gloria brought a picture home from school that's much nicer than that of the end. I put it on the refrigerator, and everybody loves it." That's she it. has a certain, certainly a great person, great right to believe that, but it's not historically. If you looked at everything on the planet with the highest sophistication and reasoning and so on, uh, Gloria's picture is not better than her Gernick. I want, uh, we've got a little bit of time left. I want to show something that's 50 years later. 
Uh, it's hard to think when you see these bubble pictures because they're so fresh. Okay, let me let me explain this one. You want me to? You yes. No, that's what we want. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, Hobbes Bazaar called me and said, would you like to do a new shoot with the bubble? I said, sounds interesting. So I said, but I don't know where the bubble is, I have to build it. So they said, okay, we'll give you money to build it. So we built it. Uh, my son and I went to, uh, why don't you go show them how we built it? Because this, in, in other words, the first bubble, we were not sophisticated enough to show, to, to, to document how it was done. So move along to the next. No, did you show it? There's a picture there. That, okay. Oh. Okay. The way it's made is there's two hemispheres. They, they take a sheet of plexiglass, three-eighths of an inch thick, and they put it on a flat board, and the flat board has a hole in it that's six feet. And then they heat it, and it drops down to a 36-inch point where they stop. They let it cool, so now you have two hemispheres. I put a ring on them so I can hinge it, and there's also uh, another visual idea, reason for it. The visual idea is that if you don't have the ring, you will be able to see yourself. With the ring, the reflections, I can avoid them. Uh, with the ring, when I tell my smart ass story, it has, in the rings, it has jet propulsion ability. In other words, this, do you realize, uh, I make believe I put a cable on it, but that can fly anywhere on the planet. Uh, Einstein gave me some uh, <laughs> locomotion ideas, anti-gravity ideas that are incorporated in it, and she is piloting a rocket ship to go, she can go from, she can go to California in 20 seconds. If you, don't, if you don't believe it, you're going to be surprised a couple of years. But that's the dream of flying, and I think that's artists. <laughs> they sort of leave the daily life. Okay, so we on. built this thing, and something happened. I needed to get a crew that was 